good afternoon. I'm happy to see that uh, there are still people who, who are not tired of the long day already. Uh, I'm Krista Kodres. I am the professor of art history in the Institute of Artistry and Visual Studies, Visual Culture, actually, in the Estonian Academy of Arts. And I'm uh, about to be a moderator for this uh, last session of today. So uh, let me start right away. You know that um, uh, every speaker has uh, 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, so uh, let me introduce the first of them. So Pille Veljataka. Uh, she received her PhD uh, in 1986. And she's working at the um, uh, Institute of uh, Philosophy, now the Re Lithuanian Cultural Research in Institute. Um, I'm very curious to know if she uh, has uh, some Estonian background because her name indicates <laughs> to that, but I haven't met her before. So she's, um, uh, her research area is the history of uh, Lithuanian aesthetics at the end of the um, uh, 19th uh, century and the first decades of the 20th century. And she has uh, published the monograph in 2011, Aesthetic Thought in Lithuania in the Late 19th Century and Early 20th Centuries, Issues of Nationality and Sociality in Art. Uh, she's uh, author of numerous um, academic uh, uh, articles. And today she will uh, speak about the concept of the symbol in Lithuanian art criticism during the first decades of the 20th, 20th century. So please. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. So the concept of symbol was a thematic key in the debates of Lithuanian art criticism during the first Lithuanian art society exhibition from the uh, first in 1907 to the fourth in 1910. And now romanticism and symbolism, which were used by Ciulioni and several other, other painters and which represented national peculiarity, in the eyes of the public and art critics stood out in these exhibitions. Uh, the formation of a modern Lithuanian nation faced the complicated dilemma of Lithuanian's Polishness in all eras from political to linguistic. The concept of the modern nation was based on the ethnic origin and renounced the cultural tradition of the Polish speaking nobility who base their national identity on the citizenship of a Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The art of the beginning of the century highlighted that the dilemma of the national identity in the multicultural Vilnius, which was predominant by the Polish-speaking population, Art historian Lauchkaita spoke about the duality of uh, Lithuanian art because there was a separation between local Polish-speaking artists and representatives of ethnic Lithuanians who established <coughs> art society. Due to the uh, earlier mentioned dilemma of national identity, the professional art of the 20th century uh, the national romanticism created by Polish-speaking <coughs> Lithuania artists was not reflected as a tradition. The initiators of Lithuanian art could only respond negatively to the question regarding the predecessors. And the comparison of the situation of art in Lithuania and Estonia at the beginning of the 20th century shows that Estonian art innovators in the young Estonia recognized as a predecessor's artists who worked in European countries, and John, John Keller, August Reisenberg, Adam Adamson, in the 20th century, 
at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, the older generation took part in the artistic life of Estonia. Does the public uh, interested? The old generation took part in the artistic life and the public interested in Estonian art could to visit the exhibitions in Tartu and in Tallinn and to see the epigonic jet professional academist realism and realism and the trends of modernism, impressionism, art novel, expressionism and fauvism. The situation in Lithuania uh, was different. Uh, exhibitions organized by Lithuanian Art Society hardly get artworks of the old generation following the announcement regarding the organization of the Lithuanian art exhibition many amateur realistic paintings were sent from various cities of the Russian Empire to ensure the artistic quality the organizers get to engage in the selection size the second exhibition already aiming to allow only several artworks of the old trend and the major part were artworks by the young generation, the pictorial realism, impressionism, symbolism, neoromanticism, art nouveau, and uh, continuing the comparison with Estonia, the Estonian art had its own patriotic narrative. Lithuanian intelligentsia expected to have, to have the same. However, they had to accept the imagined Lithuanian art as it was created by representatives of the early modernism and mostly Chuglonis, uh, who keep surprising the public what would is incomprehensible symbolism, the words of the time, incomprehensible symbolism. Uh, it should be underlined that in Lithuania press, the art criticism <clears throat> had to be written by reviewers who had a little competence in art criticism. <laughs> and the content of the concepts of symbol and symbolism was discussed by innovators who link it the future of Lithuanian art which the neo-romanticism and symbolism as well as by traditionalist whose aesthetic taste was based on academism and realism. The traditionalist art critics from the liberal, social, democratic and Catholic wings of the national movement expected the Lithuanian art to present the patriotic narratives and symbols. For example, the famous realist writer Gemaite about the painting uh, through the night I have given it by Zmuzinavichus, where was depicted a man sitting at a desk light by a desk lamp and reading. The artwork was interpreted by Gemaite as the symbol of all young intelligentsia who was sparing no efforts to get educated for the sake of, sake of the good of the nation. The artist taste of the major of Lithuanian intelligentsia formed in the pre-modernistic paradigm the question how to understand Churlonis meant how to understand art following the paradigm shift from classics to modernism, which came to the Lithuania as symbolism and neoromanticism. Uh, the question was relevant to the public since the first Lithuanian art exhibition. Uh, the reaction to the cycle by Churlonis, the storm, could serve as an example. During a visit to the exhibitions, exhibition, a provincial person <laughs> expressed his disgust about insulted religion. So lightning strikes the cross the symbol of the fate and the devil is sneering. A public man of a social democrat wing, uh, Yasukaitis explained the indirect <laughs> meaning of the storm in such a way. Uh, it's a symbol of a storm that arises in a human soul and the 
regret that comes on after match from seeing the damage done to the health, to all health sacred and dear. In her review, Jemaita interpret, interpreted the storm as the folk narrative. <clears throat> In the folk narrative, storms were caused by devils as a form of rebellion against good. However, this devil only managed to topple an old cross and uh, now sitting unhappy about the restored world order. Under alias Profane, the Catholic cultural journal published the review of the Second Lithuanian Art Exhibition, the introduction, introduction of which was about symbolism. So I quote, to symbolize means to convey an abstract subject by visual shape. So it was a good thing for the Lithuanian art to emerge at the time when the European art started to replace the shallow realism with the symbolism and the deep ideas. A new trend of art always repudiates the incident which also happened with symbolism in Europe. However, Lithuanian artists can avoid the mistakes made by European uh, symbolists who rejected something done right in the old art, uh, i.e. the resemblance to nature. Mentioned at reviewer, Reproach Shurloni saying that he breached the mimesis principle. In this respect, circle zodiac received the least criticism because here we can to recognize what is depicted. The mentioned reviewer found that the best examples of the symbols in Lithuania are not the works by Chulonis, but the sculptures by Rimsha, especially Lithuanian plogman. He explained plogman as an allegory of the national movement. Here plogman personified the intelligentsia working hard for the culture of nation and the ailing horse, it's everything that was left to Lithuanian by the past, and the eyes and the posture of the horse expressed, I quoted the set, patience. So the symbolical meaning is attached to the iconographical motives of realism, and here symbol is any trope, and no difference is made between uh, allegory and symbol. Adomas Jakštas, chief of the board of the Catholic magazine uh, Draugia, uh, had a strictly, strictly negative position to the uh, symbolism of the second generation. In the basis of the, the basis of Catholic art criticism was the neo-scholastic aesthetics, the classical paradigm antagonist ideal of the beauty, non-mimetic relation which nature was considered a mistake of modernism. For Yakštas, a good symbolist paintings of Churlonis, a uh, cycle zodiac, and for example, the past. Meanwhile, uh, the triptych Prince Gianni is, no, I quote, is not symbolism, but abracadabra, where the beauty is replaced by the strange extraordinary. Uh, as the artist being the modernist wanted to surprise the viewer and thus made the piece of art unapproachable to the mind and unpleasant to the sense, the end. The epithets rebus or abracadabra were used in respect to many works of Churlonis, uh, the paintings by Stabrauskas, uh, a recognized artist who lived in Poland and participated in the Lithuanian Art Society exhibitions, were considered as right and correct symbolism. Here is the happiness and the golden fairy tale by Stabrauskas. Uh, 
There were mimetic in their form, but containing theatrical and erotic characteristics. But Yakshtas praised the beauty of the picting and did not feel their decadentic mood. Since the third Lithuanian art society exhibition, which was, which was influenced by the recognition of Chulonis in the circles of Miriskustva, the discourse of symbolism started to change the question uh, how to understand the symbolistic artwork was replaced by the rhetoric question. Uh, should we attempt to understand, answering to which art critics usually suggested, feel and experience as the meaning of symbol is unclear in general, and the essential polysemy of the symbol in symbolism and the important of the importance of intuition was outlined. Northworthy is article by a young philosopher Beethoven. The article focused on the understanding of symbols in paintings by Churlonis. A symbol was named a poetic figure, uh, a trope, where images of nature are the comparative elements, the depiction that aimed for an uh, exact resemblance uh, would not have been advantage, but rather an uh, obstacle, as it would have prompted a viewer to admire a professional craftsmanship and to forget the aim of an image in a symbolist art. The aim is to signify. Therefore, the resemblance of an image to a nature should have been limited to the general characteristics. Therefore, uh, who complained about the lack of understanding, I quote, uh, get not even a drop of poetry in their souls. Thus, Beethoven took it upon himself to explain to the public that symbolist artwork could not longer be interpreted using the code of the national romanticism and that the complex metaphors, the symbols demanded the poetic perception abilities. Uh, highly educated public man, Mikolas Birshishka, in his review of the Fed exhibition, encouraged to give up rational explanations and instead trust the aesthetic sense of intuition. Uh, he was the first who started speaking about the esoteric nature of artwork by Churlonis. Uh, in contrast to many other reviewers, oh, excuse me, uh, Birgishka found that the separate visions of Churlonis were more important to the Lithuanian art then correctly made pieces of Stavrauskas or the Neoromanticism by Zmudzinavichus. By the way, the fourth exhibition had many neoromantic patriotic motives of the greatness and suffering of the nation, the motive of the coast of arms of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, the motive of the landscape which crosses. Viewers who expected to see patriot patriotic narrative, and this narrative was pre previously in existence due to the regions named at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, they gave a priority to these paintings. On the other hand, uh, as started by art critics, more viewers gained the ability to perceive modern art and began to like the symbolism by Chulonis. The history of symbolism is rather short and its time in Lithuanian art exhibitions ended with the passing of Chulonis and the withdrawal by Stabrauskas. However, different circumstances imagined, imagined uh, in regard to the reflection of symbolism, which continued to grow once Shulonis became the emblem of the national art. The national specificity 
of art and symbolism became related. First, thanks to the critics of Mir Iskustva, who viewed the symbolism by Chulonis as the manifestation of the national spirit. Lithuanian authors who previously referred, referred to Chulonis as a decadent started discovering uh, motifs of fairy tales and legends in his artworks. In 1940, following Chulonis exhibitions in Petersburg and Moscow, Russian art critics Valerian Chudovsky, symbolist Vyacheslav Ivanov, analyzed it as a phenomenon of symbolism. In the second decade, the text of Lithuanian poet symbolists who analyzed the topic of national specificity uh, focused on the cosmogonic and pantheistic dimensions of the uh, symbolism of Chulonis, its relations with the archaic world we have worldview of folk art. A vision, a fantasy, a fairy tale uh, would remain the keywords of the Lithuanian art of the beginning of 20th century. Lithuania had no movement, uh, named Young Lithuania, but of course, uh, had the program text of the innovators of Lithuania art and literature. As a researcher, Osha Yurgutiene says, the aesthetic and artworks of neo-romantics provided the Lithuanian soul, which gets mystical primal ordinal image. Having in mind the sociocultural circumstances uh, discussed at the beginning of the presentation, which get an impact on the national cultural projects, I may say that uh, young Estonia proclaimed, let us remain Estonians, but let us become Europeans too. Let's create the Estonian art following the European modernism. Uh, in Lithuanian art, innovations were less radical form, were less radical from the point of view of acceptance of modernism. They focused their attention on the national specificity of art. And this could be explained by the neo-romantic symbolistic orientation of the national art project and its pathos related to the ethnicity, the treatment of an artist as a mediator of the national spirit, the inspiration drawn from the Lithuanian folk art, uh, which preserved the Pagan worldview. Compared to the Protestant Estonia, Lithuanian culture were, was less secularized, secularized, and the Catholic wing of the national movement got a high cultural authority. Lithuanian art innovators opposed their project to the views of those who had authority in such a way that radical contradictions get to be avoided. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. So we proceed with the papers and uh, discuss them then afterwards all together here in front of you. And um, our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Janis Kreslins. Uh, she's um, uh, a scholar uh, in uh, working in the, in Stockholm in the Kungliga Bibliotheken in Royal Library. Um, uh, I happen to know him a long time, and uh, she's uh, really a scholar who is uh, working with the interdisciplinary subjects. Um, uh, and today he's. Um, speaking about, the, as it is also titled in our session, uh, about the dissemination uh, of the um, uh, new aesthetic of uh, symbolism uh, and um, uh, her empirical material uh, is uh, the cover design. So we are moving from the concepts to the dissemination, but um, 
of course, um, uh, to, to choosing the style is uh, also a concept uh, of its own. So please, uh, Janis, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank two of my predecessors here, Bart and also uh, Christiana. Uh, Bart's uh, notion of dual poles of understanding will be important for my understanding today, as well as Christiana's notion of das nordische Geprege, uh, what that really means. But the print world, on the brink of change at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, has most frequently been portrayed against the background of the radical changes ushered in by photo relief techniques and the sudden ubiquity of mass-produced photomechanical reproductions. Concurrently, electricity had transformed reading practices and industrial modernization had revolutionized production processes. Scholarly interest in artistic innovation in the book has been largely limited to graphic and type design. I shall be moving in a different direction today. My brief contribution today shall concentrate on the symbolization of contextual context and the formation of a syntax, syntax of artistic expression. This syntax was displayed firstly by symbolizing ideas rather than representing the form of aspect of actual objects Secondly, by symbolizing states of mind. And finally, by allowing indirectness and emptiness at times characterize the power of creative thought, of visual images, and uh, language. By doing so, I shall be moving away from forms of representation firmly and possibly exclusively grounded in image and move towards more textual contexts. For book culture, this involves moving beyond images in books as mere illustrations and turning our attention to typography, text boxes, color, document layout, and last but not least, trapping, that is, embellishment and external at times seemingly trifling decoration. Furthermore, I shall be doing my utmost to undertake a serious geographical analysis that could do justice to the topic of our gathering here today. This shall involve incorporating material, in this particular case most often visible for the public, invisible for the public due to its character and form and nature, from various shores of the Baltic. This shall presuppose some topographical reconfiguration. The ge this geography shall question set parameters and at the same time argue that the material on view today may be expressing more than is commonly uh, accepted. It may compel us to revisit the notions of constants and variables in the Baltic. Most of us would probably agree that it is unwise to have a fixed observation platform when we are picturing space in the Baltic. Without movement, perspective in the Baltic usually seems to be circumscribed. In our Baltic modal modality, at the critical point at which modern identities took form and started to evolve, imagery and perception overlapped, thus engendering a predilection for indirectness. What you saw was not truly what you saw. The stage setting today will underscore this clearly. The book, which had been a rather straightforward vehicle for presentation, suddenly was engrossed in a centrifugal movement and became obscured by its omnipresence, its mutability, and its evolvability. The new book, quickly produced and quickly consumed, unexpectedly possessed a hitherto rare capability of undergoing evolutionary change. Nowhere is this more evident than on its covers, which encapsulated the various moves of the era and the moments of upheaval in visual representation. The cover shall also be the focal point of my musings here today. 
their artistic and graphic expression foretold of the radical split between the Western and Eastern realms in the Baltic, which characterized the long 20th century. Covers for many of us today constitute the most readily visible part of a book, and thus the maxim, don't judge a book by its cover. The covers in our time period, however, due to their anonymity, turned into a very powerful tool for the promulgation of Weltanschauungs and provided an unusual stage for creativity, experimentation, and self-expression. Difficult to trace down, they provided a free zone of sorts. Firstly, to circumvent the diligent eye of the censor, and secondly, to intimate meanings beyond the readily perceptible. The covers, frequently designed by hand, seemingly lived a life of their own, independent of the texts that these books contained. Their materiality underscored their ordinariness. We find ourselves in a world of cardboard and inexpensive, heavily acidic paper. And due to their special materiality, they most often were bound perfunctorily, and thus they were often regarded as disposable. Materially, this region was, was unified as a whole. As identity markers, however, they diverged significantly. On the eastern shore, national aspirations combined with a newfound individuality colored their modes and their tonalities. On the western shore, the notion of statehood was already coalesced with the notion of community in which identity was not automatically expressed as an ethnic category. To best encapsulate the various moods of the era, we need not look further than to the book covers, most often hidden from view, since they appeared and disappeared so quickly. A revolution was taking place in the covers in the way artists were redefining space, in how they were mixing heterogeneous and homogeneous artistic environments in space that was a world unto itself and delineated not only conceptually but also physically a separate reality. Book production no longer was a domain of major population centers apart from the critical scrutiny of public opinion. It is on the cover that we frequently can discern the direction of development and calibrate the power of these changes. One of the most serious challenges in circumscribing this material is getting access to it. Extremely fragile, it has survived only environments which, where preservation, has, where preservation measures have been taken. The quality of its paper foundation is suspect at best. They can be very colorful, they form a sharp contrast to the rather drab and drearily dull, most frequently top tip hypographically nondescript texts. Striking in this all is all the almost lack of, almost total lack of photographic images. The cover serves as an advertisement, but one that draws attention to individual copies and from one copy to the next. Of note is the frequency with which print runs are mentioned and how small some of them were. At times, no greater than 10. This endows these works with a special quality that could be regarded as a throwback to the hand-pressed era. And with such particularization and categorization, it is fair to ask if any generalization of a pattern conceptually or aesthetically is possible at all. I shall nonetheless be engaging in just that, and therefore here my four features which I think are of value. Firstly, the eastern shore, due to its shifting mental top top uh, topographies and seemingly constant turbulence, is characterized by borderless figures and transitions with interdependency and entanglement, lacking symmetry. The covers are very communicative, steeped in semi-communication. Their goal is not the transfer of information but rather the meeting with the reader itself. In this regard, the covers strongly reflect the traditions of orality, immediate and participatory, lively and spontaneous. The covers from, which, from the Western regions are much more codified. 
frequently conceived as watchtowers, they lead us not into a reality here and now, but into an other reality demarcated by very clear defined borders. In this sense, they precurse modern Scandinavian architecture, which with the help of windows introduced the natural light into otherwise dark environments, opened up space in otherwise cumbersome settings, and played with the notion of nothing else, emptiness. Second observation, the dominance of hand designed lettering in the East and typeset in the West. This contradistinction is closely conflated with the binary pair of orality and literacy. Most of the artists on the Eastern Shore belong to the first generation to have received a formal education and formal academic training at the academy. They were not far removed from the cultural roots of orality and still possessed the command of its tools. As these artists forged their new identities or when they experimented on the covers, they did not simply embrace and assimilate the artistic language of the academy, nor did they turn their backs on the culture that in many regards had formed them. The covers on the Western Shore, on the other hand, are embedded in lead type. We could say that the Western covers are heavy metal. <laughs> embedded in heavy type, stolid, revealing minimal emotion or sensibility. Uh, unbound by this kind of tradition, the covers on the Eastern Shore, as we see here, we show that the response to Gothic type was not Latinity or antique as a type, type set, in which all lines are of uniform thickness. These, these texts, these types, are not mere harbingers of a new style. Rather, they embrace this flux even orthographically. We are in a world apart from lead type. We are long, far apart from the preservation mode and sustainability which type conveys. The question covers are much more weighted and deterministic as an external agent were acting upon the will. The predominantly hand-styled lettering of the Eastern Shore exudes a sense of ephemerality. Uh, it required an unmediated encounter with the beholder. Every stroke represented uh, a new order, encapsulated even a self-destructive strain, and lacked almost all the attributes of codification. Each ductus, just as each speech act in oral communication, is new, and it challenges the beholder to embrace interdependency and entanglement. The preser motion mo preservation mode and symmetry in the West, engagement and lack of symmetry in the East. Symmetry shall also be the third point of entry today. The covers from the Western region are uh, strikingly simple and uncluttered. Uh, Empty space is perhaps the most palpable element here, invoking a simplicity that is as disarming as it is frank. In many cases, the drafted images are subsumed into a vast litany of light, a space which is many, in many senses without clear contours, uh, despite well-articulated borders. Thought processes and sublimation are set in motion by emptiness, in many regards, the designs are mechanical and industrial. Emptiness creates chaos, but it is well-girded, bracing up the empty space for action. Mechanical in character, thus reducible and directly engaged. The emptiness fosters an entanglement, very differently than from on the eastern shore, and by clearly defining borders, a sense of order is upheld. The cover transforms into an, an era uh, an arena for replacing the natural and the pristine with a new type of nature, one that derived its inner strength from its voidness and destituteness and money, in many senses, unnaturalness. A naturalness that derives its strength from unnaturalness. Text befuddles despite its clar clarity, and that, of course, is the Scandinavian, Scandinavian way. This void is very strongly grounded in the present, is very practical, and aspires to be modern. Uh, and in this regard, it is history-less. One can shed all the trappings of identity and the social-political boundings, 
boundaries these trappings then designate. On the eastern shore, instead of immersing in the opportunities which emptiness offers, new solutions, here's emptiness, new solutions were created, devised for historicizing one's culture and thus one's identity. Creative and provocative strategies were chosen. The covers lacked traditional uh, iconography, icon iconography, which is so typical of the culture of literacy. The past is not to be traced, but rather ornamentalized without the accoutrements of historical insignia. Here we see that if we look back and forth, differences. Hmm? Uh, we are, the past is to be ornamentalized, and here we see actually a very interesting receipt, which is not a cover, but which illustrates this perfectly. We are drawn into the world of folklore, which conjured notions of the distant past and a newfound identity. We see here three different orthographies, different ways of writing, a mixture of languages, and basically a hodgepodge of information. Uh, the tradition to which all this hearkened could not be traced or visualized since it changed in every single account encounter. Nonetheless, it is a canon which can also always be repeated in new forms. In many regards, this is a reconfiguration of that which already had been reconfigured previously, one which was known from the world of folklore. But folklore had at this juncture already slipped into the realm of collectors into a preservation mode and was a part of the world which required dictionaries. Dictionaries are filled, as we know, with obstructive accumulation. In comparison to the emptiness of the white spaces on the western shore, the eastern covers are brimming with dangling and misplaced modifiers, obfuscating all boundaries and generating, generating dangerous dynamics. The emptiness of the western covers is with astounding frequency accompanied by a window, our fourth observation. Uh, just as in architectural settings in which Scandinavian design with the help of windows transformed industrial buildings and domestic interiors into nodes that capture the natural world of wonder of nature, albeit through glass, this same tendency can be observed on the covers. The rather expansive empty spaces often revolve around a window, carefully out outlined, which provide a direct view of the natural world but also underline a separation. Nature is transformed into an integral part of a man-made world, and this nature is refined and sublimated, often overly so with disparaging implications. Despite its nearness, it is not nearly integrated and participatory, not really integrated or participatory. More importantly, it leaves in, us in the role of a spectator and does not leave a dent in our souls. The Eastern covers, on the other hand, reach out in a very concrete sense to the beholder. Strict boundaries and borderlines evaporate. They are imbued with a fleetingness of the moment and draws directly into work, into the work and thereby a human beingness. Instead of separation, they call to engagement and involvement, not to definition, or preservation, and they can change very frequently just along the way in just a couple of seconds. This world never fits into a package. The window pane is no longer symmetrical. We never reach a clear understanding of that which we are witnessing. Human experience, most pregnant when everything appears as enveloped in smoke, not symmetrical, and not readily understandable. Geometric forms are transformed into an imaginary, imaginary figuration. Surprisingly enough, these covers reflect in very clear ways the divergent use of language during this period. Western covers frolic in simple garments. They use a simple syntax for a complex semantics. In a region that is known for its predilection for participial constructions, the Eastern covers reflect this linguistic characteristic. They are grammatically independent of the main clause. They are intended to be independent of the text and for the occasion or circumstance which the book states as a whole. 
east or west, covers the covers enable us to form an ability to remember the future and to explore the psychological dimension of memory. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yanis. Fascinating. And we are coming to our last speaker. Uh, as, um, I'm glad to say that in this session, all the Baltic republics are <laughs> represented. So the last um, representative is uh, from Estonia, and um, uh, she's Christel Papper, uh, one of uh, the three um, uh, doctors of uh, in humanities. She's, she's the uh, musicologist working in the Academy of uh, uh, Music and Theatre in Tallinn. Um, and she's uh, the leading person for doctoral studies uh, uh, there. So she has, has also been a guest professor of uh, musical theatre in Vienna and, um, and uh, has had uh, several other scholarships uh, working also in, in Germany. Um, and has uh, contributed to many monographs. And as I know, she's uh, at the moment uh, writing uh, for the, um, uh, and is one of the editors of the um, uh, history of uh, Estonian music. So uh, today, uh, Christel Pappel uh, will talk about musical modernism in Estonia around uh, 1900, please. Dear colleagues, at first, many thanks for organizing this conference and for the possibility to say some words about music. The turn of the 20th century was a time of radical change, not only in visual art, but also in music, where we begin to see in the emergence of a tonality, as well as the continuing decline of classical romantic harmonic structures and form. This was accompanied by the expanding or, or long 19th century in which late romantic Wagnerian complexity had retained its novelty. As Thomas Mann remarked, when discussing new music in 1900, one spoke of Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. Musical modernism in Estonia emerged around the year 1910, receiving its first impulses from the musical life in St. Petersburg. The first generation of Estonian composers received formal training from the St. Petersburg Conservatory around the turn of the century and was heavily influenced by the multicultural and multi-ethnic milieu of the imperial Russian capital. The fellow students included the likes of Sergei Prokofiev and Igor Stravinsky, who, like Mart Saar, studied with most famous composition professor of the time, Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov. Each composer reacted to the emerging modernist aesthetics in his own way. Rudolf Tobias, considered the first professional Estonian composer, was very much a Wagnerian, envisioning synthesis of artistic genres, not in opera, but in the form of a melodrama and of an expanded oratorio. His organ chorals are heavily chromatic, but never leave the tonal framework. Tobias was declared by Estonian newspapers of the time to be the country's first modernist composer, but we would say his music belongs to the late 
romantisismi. Mazar, nine years younger than Tobias, was born in the same year as Stravinsky and studied at the St. Petersburg Conservatory from 1901 to 1907, after which he continued studying privately with composer Anatoly Yadov. From 1999 to 1911, he split his time between St. Petersburg and Tartu, where he played an active role in the local music scene as an organist and pianist. Saar was particularly fascinated with the new harmonic language of Alexander Skriabin, whose music he held in very high regard. While in St. Petersburg, he was able to hear Skriabin, also a talented pianist, perform some of his own compositions. It is interesting to note that in keeping with the spirit of the 19th century, Saar's professors, such as Rimsky Korsakov, made use of exotic folk elements in their music, thereby adopting a national musical language. Saar's primary idol, Skriabin, however, was one of the very few Russian composers who had not the slightest interest in folk music or national characteristics. Saar's oeuvre includes music of both tendencies. Saar's piano work, Skitze, composed around the year 1910, is thought to be one of the first, if not the very first, example of musical modernism in Estonian music. Skitze was published together with works by the Northeast Young Estonia group in the 1910 journal. You see the cover uh, is designed by Nikolai Trik. Sars other major sympathy was the music of Claude Debussy and the French Impressionists, whose influence is apparent in many of his piano works. Skitze is, with its intensity, an example of musical expressionism, sharing similarities with Scriabin's music. The harmonic, the harmonic language of Skitze which sometimes loses all traces of a tonal center, unprecedented in Estonian music at the time, brought Saar to the core problem surrounding the newest development in art music, the departing from tonality and the emancipation of the dissonance, as Arnold Schoenberg stated. Schoenberg is attributed with creating the first atonal compositions in his Opus 11, Drei Klavierstücke, which dates back to 99. Skitze seems to have been very much on the cutting edge of European art music, which was yearning for a new and hitherto unexperienced mode of expression. We will now listen to Skitze, uh, almost a uh, whole piece, but not uh, um, the whole. So.
Uh, there is some confusion surrounding the exact time this piece was written. Must Lind, Blackbird, for solo voice and piano is attributed to the year 99 or according to the other sources, 1910. It can be seen to make use of symbolism in music, in Estonian music, of course. And um, Must Lind, Blackbird, is a sitting of a symbolist text by Estonian poet Karli Rotsöt, in which the archetype of the black bird is symbolic of death or of fate. A foreboding atmosphere is created by dark sounds from the low register of the piano. The melody descends along a whole tone row, lacking any tonal stability. As a character marking, the composer has written simply mystery also. Muslind also evokes an intimate understanding of nature's so raw expressive potential in a way befitting of Tsar, whose childhood was spent in the heavily forested Estonian countryside. This results in a synthesis of symbolism and nature. And we will now listen to the songs Climax. mentioned works by Sar seem to grow out of more complex environment, one far more multilayered than would have been experienced by him in Estonian society, and as such most likely stem from his time spent in St. Petersburg. Estonia lacked the musical context for such works. In the 19th century, the professional music and theatre scene in Estonia, urban life centered around the Baltic German middle class and aristocracy was quite active. Ethnic Estonians were able to enter the professional cultural realm in the end of the 19th century, very much following in the footsteps of the established Germans. However, the musical life in the Baltic Germans was lacking of any outstanding composers, outstanding composers. One of the most popular musicians and composer was Otto Muischel from Riga, whose music drama Weltuntergang was performed to great acclaim in both Tartu and Tallinn in 93. 
The libretto was written by Christoph Mikwitz, literate and a journalist in Tallinn, and was based on a story of Felix Dahn, a German writer and historian. It is worth noting that Baltic German newspapers considered the work to be both Wagnerian and symbolist. Unfortunate, unfortunately, only the libretto of the work has survived. In this context, symbolism is likely to refer to certain meanings which the public attributed to characters and situations that arose in the drama. The work is set thousand years after Christ and Jupiter poses pagans and they got such a water with Christians. The final act takes place on a summer solstice and ends favoring the Christians. This particularly spoke to the local Germans for whom the national awakening of the once pagan Estonians posed a political threat to the ruling, ruling class. In conclusion, it may be said that modernism first appeared in Estonian music quite unexpectedly thanks to Marc Saar, whose music remained anomalous for some time. In the interwar period, Leading Estonian composers attended the new music festivals of Europe, thereby exposing themselves to the prevailing trends in music. Many of them remarked that the most radical wing of the new music, for example, the Second Viennese School, led by Schoenberg, did not speak to them. What did speak to them, however, was the neoclassical music of Stravinsky, the folk lore influenced works of Bela Bartok. And modernism in music returned to Estonia only at the end of the 1950s, after Stalinist era and as a result of Ruschow law. Estonian compos composers could continue what Mart Saar had started only 50 years later. Thank you for your attention. So, <laughs> well, uh, it is um, not easy to start the discussion because um, we had um, uh, papers from at first glance, uh, from very different areas, uh, being art, visual culture, or mass culture, actually, and, 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 um, uh, and the music. But, um, uh, and at the same time, also, the, the, the geographical scope, or, or the, actually, the perspectives were, <laughs> were, were, were from towards um, different um, uh, sites of, of uh, the Baltic Sea. I mean, the, the Russian, the, 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 the Scandinavian, and the, the Polish one. But um, at, the si at the same time, of course, um, as um, Janis Kresslinch uh, said, this, um, uh, this uh, very uh, actually old um, notion of Weltanschauung, it seems to me that um, there are uh, some, some features that uh, still unite uh, uh, this um, uh, these uh, impressions or this um, this uh, phenomena that uh, were discussed in in the papers. So uh, when I think about it, then uh, of course first that comes into mind is uh, the um, idea of modernization, idea of uh, feeling that uh, that what we do is uh, is new and modern and different. Um, the, the, the emancipation of the old was, um, I think, um, one of the topics uh, still here, uh, but. Um, uh, when I, um, when you allow, then I ask uh, some first um, uh, questions that I had, um, uh, and then uh, I, I give floor to the audience to to uh, to discuss uh, the subject that uh, were interesting for you. So I, I would like to ask from Pilla first of all, what um, you said. You mentioned about this, um, uh, this, um, you know, the, the need uh, to be different from the Polish or to, to build our the, the national narrative uh, of Lithuanians. Um, 
uh, in confrontation with the Polish. So what were the slow, I mean, the, how, how it was um, then um, uh, spoken out? What was the difference? Uh, because uh, was it the, the, the religion or this paganness of Lithuanian culture that was um, making the difference between Polish and, and uh, uh, Lithuanian art or the concept of, of the symbolist art? The difference uh, between the uh, art created by the Polish uh, segment in Vilnius art life in the beginning of the 20th century and the uh, Lithuanian segment, those Lithuanians who uh, created their, their uh, national narrative in the ethnical base of Lithuanianness. Uh, they were uh, different uh, because of uh, uh, political uh, regions of uh, uh, national identity, self-identification, and they hold the exhibitions uh, uh, not in a one place, but uh, uh, Polish uh, exhibitions and the Lithuania exhibitions and they try to find uh, some connections to make the old exhibition. So uh, uh, the basis of the problem was uh, not a treatment of a modernism, a treatment of a symbolism, a treatment of a, a way the art made to uh, go, uh, but uh, uh, some political uh, reasons and the because the vision of the Lithuanian nation based on uh, ethnical origin was one, and the uh, Polish, uh, the, 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 the part of the uh, speaking Polish, who uh, self identified them as a Lithuanian, but a Lithuanian based in the tradition of the old Lithuania, the, Lithuania of the, 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 the old Lithuania. Was it also visually, uh, in, in a way, articulated? I mean, uh, could, could you make a difference if you look at the uh, at, um, art? So this is Polish and this is Lithuania. I can uh, make a difference because I know the artists and know who is Ferdinand Ruschitz, and so I can make a difference. But if you don't know, if you don't see the families, the symbolism was the, the one, the one symbolism was. Good, that's, a, <laughs> that's a good uh, starting point for the, the further questions. But let me move on with my questions, um, just to Yanis. So, um, so, well, since I have been um, also dealing with the issue of uh, word and image, so I didn't, uh, because I don't uh, understand all the languages, I mean Latvian is not known to me, I cannot read and understand. So still this uh, relationship between the, the book cover or the illustration and uh, the content, was there any, any or what, how, how do you des describe it? I don't think there was a direct connection, mainly because this was also a source of income, which I didn't mention. This was a quick, quick dollar uh, for the artists. Uh, can you make a cover? I'll pay you on the fly. And uh, I'm not even sure that they had ever read the material that was in the book. But, uh, but still, I think this, uh, the, 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 the issue is actually great because uh, it is really this uh, dissemination of this uh, new, new pictorial expression, uh, expressionist that, um, uh, that came. But, but still, I, I, that's, uh, this is a very interesting issue, you know, this, um, mm -hmm. uh, how, to, how to illustrate uh, something which the content might be of, of uh, actually not um, pictorial at all or picturesque at all. Exactly, and if, if your perception of a Swede is that a Swede is slow, stodgy, and uh, very set in his ways, you just look at the covers, uh, which is heavy lead. Uh, it's not flexible, it's not moving, and so forth. It is the epitome of stability. The eastern shore was the epitome of the opposite, 
which makes for a creative, incredibly, incredibly dynamic uh, stage. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you get the wonderfulness of empty space and how empty space can be used for our, in, as a tool of artistic expression. And the other ones are, get in as much as you can on that cover. <laughs> uh, I can maybe s fit in another image or something like that. I hope you are not reflecting on the, some cliche of national character or something, but... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm only talking about the covers, not the national character. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, and then Crystal. So it's uh, so fun, fascinating because in a um, uh, uh, conference of art history, we normally don't have um, the musicologist, but it, it's really uh, struck me because, uh, you know, Mark Saar and Tobias are, the, of course, national classics. Uh, but um, this, what you, what we could listen in your presentation, was very dark. So, uh, so unusually dark, I must say. Um, yes, is uh, is um, is this a very general future still uh, feature of the of the music um, in Estonia? But and uh, if you make an, an another comparison, for example, to if you know uh, to to Latvia, for example, is there similarities to be observed? Yes, uh, I cannot say that uh, such features are only in the Estonian music, absolutely not. And for example, a uh, big friend of Mart Saar was in Latvia um, composer Zalitis. And they know, uh, they knew very well um, themselves. And, uh, and uh, also this musical language is quite similar. So that there were uh, some tendencies and we know that <laughs> is it so in the art or in the arts uh, that uh, in certain conditions and in certain uh, surrounding or, or environment uh, there can emerge then Yes, and now the, 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 the floor is for the audience to ask uh, questions or make commentaries. So please just uh, um, raise your hand and, um, and perhaps st stand up because uh, then you can have the microphone which is necessary because we, uh, the, the, the session is uh, recorded as you know. We still have some time. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. That was a fascinating session. And, and not only were we looking at three different cultural spaces, but we were also thinking, asked to think about um, reception, production, reception, and circulation um, at the same time. I'm, any of the three of you um, might take this on. I'm very interested in the fact that each one of you, in some way or another, addressed a new special um, audience experience, a new reception experience, whether uh, in the uh, rhetoric of art critics in Lithuania who kept changing the, uh, the ways in which symbolism was supposed to be understood and received and finally gave a tremendous amount of responsibility to the receiving viewer, to the, the, the viewer's share became very important. In the book covers that you spoke about, um, which I have some more questions about later. Um, there's a special way in which the receiver and the viewer of the book covers needs to do a particular kind of work that is maybe unconventional in these very crowded, asymmetrical, you know, smoky, whatever they are, covers, so that the viewer's share, again, becomes something different from other experiences of reading. In the musical, realm also suddenly the receiver's share becomes different with the sort of whatever the, the liberation of um, dissonance um, or darkness I guess as you're calling it so it seems to me that there's this moment in in each of these three cultural spaces where there's a responsibility as we think about what symbolism means and how it operates and how we define it a responsibility in in the receiver I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say about that or not. <laughs> I would just... like to say that um, that we can see in the exhibition hall here, we heard it, you are directly addressed in many ways. 
you cannot back away from the, the engagement. You cannot say, this does not affect me, uh, as you can very frequently do with text or image which you don't regard as uh, in innovatory and in some ways challenging. First of all, second of all, I think the very interesting thing here, which is uh, which we haven't spoken so much of, so m much about, is of course materiality. There are very interesting things taking place in terms of material. This is basically your cell phone, Instagram account. Uh, you are producing images. You're spreading images in the same way as you spread a selfie today. In other words, it's gone in a second. Uh, and I think uh, that certainly is, you know, we, you feel that uh, the turnaround, I think that everything happens, I mean, there is, you are, in, you are directly involved. You're no longer a spectator. That's why it's so interesting that the Scandinavian window uh, creates a new type of looking. The, act, the actual act of looking is different. Uh, then it, you know, it, question is, am I there? Am I in nature, which is on the other side of the glass window, or am I not? And that's the whole, this ambiguity is basically what has made Sweden rich with Scandinavian design. Or Sc Scandinavia rich with Scandinavian design. Yes, I think uh, reception and audience are very important factors. Uh, when I think uh, of music uh, written by Mark Tsar, for example, then of course they were very demanding for the listeners. And also maybe they affected listeners too much, too deep. And that was unusual in this time in Estonian music. About the reception and the public, uh, to receive the Chulonis was a very hard task for the Lithuanian public, of course, and the uh, art criticism, the reviewers who had no uh, uh, big competence to write about this, they tried, they wrote, and they explained um, the artworks of Julonis, how they could. And the moment from this that the public said, we don't understand nothing, we don't understand what is this, to the uh, point when they began to understand, when they began to feel, to uh, experience this, is a very short time, it was, uh, about four years, four or five years. So the communication that was made by art criticism was a very big uh, job, a very big. Question, was his music just as difficult to assimilate? That was a very interesting session and I have questions for all three of you if I may, two of, ju two of which are just ex questions for explanation. Um, one is about the um, uh, Giulionis. I notice he worked a lot in tempera. That's a, an unusual technique, and I'm wondering uh, how widespread it was. You know, was tempera, as opposed to oil painting, watercolors, or other techniques, special to him? Was it general all over Lithuania? Was it so? How how widespread was tempera as a technique in the late 19th century? Um, the music one, I was thinking about Marit Saar um, and that type of modernity. Um, w would it, could it be possible that this is also peculiar to a type of music that's developing specifically in chamber music at the time? I was wondering if, it would, if you might get a different impression if you look at the music that's, that was written for the concert hall. Um, and as regards the book covers, um, there I, I, I was very, very intrigued. Um, and I was also thinking, um, I have just looked at some of the work of Richard Zarins, um, 
an engraver who was really mainstream and very highly qualified with all the resources of the Russian Empire behind his craft and his skill. Money. And, and if, you, if you look at the mastheads that, and the things that he discovered for periodicals, you see it's very geometric sometimes and it uses these weaving patterns, the Ausekli's eight-pointed stars and very different from the type of fluid, organic, liquid, asymmetrical forms that you have seen in the book covers. So I'm wondering if you can resolve that conundrum for me, how, the, 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 if you like, the geometry of the weaving patterns uh, relates to the, 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 the typology you've established for the book covers. Why, why he used tempera? Uh, he mm, at first hadn't the oil materials for the oil painting. He was uh, a, a poor man. He was a poor man, and he worked on the paper and on by by tempera. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you for this question, it's a very good question, and uh, that you are absolutely right that um, the in in innovation, the absolutely new in uh, 98, 99, 90, 10 in European music and in Estonian music was in chamber music like um, Schoenberg's uh, second quartet. Uh, with one part uh, in a tonality, and then um, 1909, as I said, Schoenberg has written his famous three Adrei Klavierstücke, absolutely atonal, and uh, also solo pieces for solo clavier. Uh, that is. Uh, actually a difficult musicological or music, music theoretical uh, problem and that was also a question of Schoenberg to himself. Can I write atonal music for large orchestra? And uh, also he responded um, some years later, and he wrote some pieces for, for orchestra. Uh, in Estonia, in this time, it, it was impossible to write such music, like we have heard written by Marzar for orchestra. And there were <laughs> no such orchestras, and uh, also no such... Um, performers. I think it's a free zone, which means that it's an, a stage for experimentation. What I have seen, I can't prove it, I, because I can't find it. I don't know where it is. I think the covers were very frequently ripped off and kept separately, and also were, in other words, thrown into the garbage somewhere else not together with the book. Remember, this is basically all um, uh, no hard cover. I'm not. I had, didn't show anything hard cover here. It's all um, brochures of various sorts. It's uh, only survived because it has been uh, encased in cardboard uh, jackets. We could say. In and, and that's been done by the memory institutions who have identified this as something interesting. And this was, of course, done uh, mostly at least 50 years ago when that was regarded as important, when memory institutions took care of their works, as opposed to today. <laughs> Shouldn't say that. But uh, um, uh, there was money for that. I mean, it, 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 there was enough, it was deemed important enough to do that. Today, they would say, let's not do that. It's too costly. Let's just digitize it, and who cares? That would be the approach today. But so I think it's the ephemeral nature, that it was, you know, you could, you, it would disappear. You could, you could do things, crazy things, and nobody would, could get at you.
So, any other questions, comments? Yes, please. I'll be quick, so I know we all want to go. I just want to thank you very much for a very stimulating discussion. And I'd like to take a minute to pursue Pat Berman's um, direction in which she uh, explored the idea of reception. And um, I'd like to ask all of you who are there what you think about the idea of reception and the philosophical nature of the discussions as they emerged in Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Russia at that time in relationship to the Young Poland Movement, the Young Lithuanian Movement in which Trelonis and his wife were very actively involved and certainly embedded in the uh, works that we have seen here um, in relationship to Young Estonia and y Young Latvia. I would like to know what your ideas are about that in the, the philosophical ideas out there permeated by these organizations in the pursuit of individuality on one hand and the pursuit of nation on the other. Um, I know it's something we'll probably explore tomorrow, but I think that's very important. Uh, their explorations of the Kantian idea of disinterested, uh, disinterested judgment and how that translated into the pursuit of individualism, but then also uh, bedded down with nationalism. So, so this is um, we are really, it is <laughs> very immensely bright subject, but um, maybe just in few words. I think that's a very important point. In other words, the collective uh, how did that uh, echo, or how do we see how this resounded in those settings? And I think, and this is a very gross simplification, you have on the eastern shore this, these national strivings. On the western shore, you replace the nation as a state in many ways with a notion of community, which is, came to be in the 20th century, the uh, common home, the folkem, the whole notion of that uh, the, the, the goal, the, the nation is really the community. It is not a political uh, formation which signals a radical change in political uh, uh, geography, rather I mean, it's, as I said, in, in the West, it's a social change. In the East, it really is in terms of redrawing borders. And of course, we're talking even about the musical influences. And just remember, we're talking about Estland, Leafland, and uh, Kurland. It's very possible that these, both of these uh, composers, I'll have to ask where Omsar was from. Was he northern Estonian or southern? In the middle of Estonia, so they basically, he, he, which means that he was basically in the same uh, administrative entity as uh, Zarinj. So I mean, they were living in the same, we'd say, in the same state. <laughs> now they're in different cultural traditions, and one is being uh, uh, kept, one is being honored in uh, Reva or Tallinn, in the, or Tartu, and the other one is being honored in Riga the irony of the 20th century. I think that, I think that the movements uh, in the young Estonia, young Latvia, and young Lithuania, it was named young Lithuania, but those movements are more in common than uh, difference. They are very, very much have, we, have, we have in common. Yes, and I, I think that uh, if you are asking about the philosophical tradition, it's uh, of course it's Herderian and Hegelian, and and also I think that this is um, this um, uh, the, the, the self self image of the the artist is um, is both. It is uh, because it it is the modern self image already. What they I think in my my opinion really they experience, and this is exactly that um, I am the I am the this. A person who is belonging to the nation, but at the same time, I'm the the the, the, the genius who is um, uh, competent in expressing this nation's 
and by that uh, I am collaborating to this uh, common goal that we have here in, in a spot. Yeah. Yes, I can only see, <laughs> say that I am agree with my colleagues. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I know that everyone is tired and um, uh, thank you all very much for staying and uh, listening to the really interesting panel also in my opinion and uh, uh, looking forward to see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>